Hi everyone, welcome. My name is John Ambatur and I'm the curator of live programs at Nottingham Contemporary. And tonight it's my pleasure to welcome you all to Futures, Maps, Memories and Mandarins with Elizabeth Povinelli and Rindon Johnson. This is the last event of our second iteration of Live Five Bodies uh, Live Readings, an online program of poetry, writing and experimental thought. All of the season's Five Bodies events were organized under the theme of entanglements and they investigate poetic ecologies in the Anthropocene, opening up new conversations around coexistence, resilience and sustainability. For those of you tuning in for the first time, Nottingham Contemporary is a contemporary art center based in the East Midlands. We work with artists, academics and communities to reflect on contemporary art society and mutual cultures. Our public programs reflect on transdisciplinary, sensorial and speculative practices of radical sense making and wayfinding via questions of repair, pedagogy, remediation and mutation. Five Bodies was imagined in conjunction with our colleagues Sarah Jackson and Dr. Linda Camp from the Critical Poetics Research Group at Nottingham Trent University. I also want to uh, thank my colleague Olivia Hearn for their support in putting together this year long poetry, this year's uh, poetry series. And of course, a word of thank you to Nottingham Trent University for graciously and generously supporting this event and acknowledge my colleague Catherine Masters for the technical support this evening. And now to our speakers this evening, I am uh, delighted to introduce uh, Rindon Johnson, Elizabeth Povinelli. I'm, I'm delighted to introduce Rindon Johnson. Uh, Rindon is an artist and poet. In 2021, Johnson presented two pen and soul exhibitions, first in spring at Sculpture Center in New York and later in autumn at Chisholm Hale, London. He is the author of four books, most recently, uh, The Love of Large Numbers, Black Sonic Abyss uh, by Chisholm Hale in Page, Impatient Sculpture Center 2021. He was born on the unceded territories of the Ohlan people. He lives in Berlin. I'm very delighted to introduce Elisabeth Povinelli, who is a critical terrorist and filmmaker. She is Franz Boss professor at Columbia University and a founding member of the Caribbean Film Collective. Her academic nonfiction and film works focus on late liberal settler governance and spaces of the otherwise. Her work spans eight books, numerous essays, and 37 years of collaboration with her indigenous colleagues in North Australia, including most recently eight films they have created as members of the Caribbean Film Collective. In terms of running order of today's event, Rindon and Elizabeth are going to read and present for around 25 minutes each. They will then be in conversation together. Due to the time zone differences, today's session is pre-recorded and there won't be a Q&A section. Does apologies in advance, but if you have any questions, you can email to me and then I can relay them to our questions. Uh, to, uh, I can relay them to our speakers. And now I'll hand it over to Rindon for uh, his presentation. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited. Um, and yeah, I don't know, I, I've admired your work for a really long time, so this is uh, very dreamy. Um, so I think what I'll do is I'll kind of share um, my work and its origins in some odd ways uh, through a series of different pieces. Uh, I wanted to focus on the kind of poetic underpinnings of the whole thing. Um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen here and then we can get going. This is actually a photograph of a work that isn't mine. Um, I, my partner, um, who's a really amazing writer and thinker and human, Sarah Harrison, she, um, she was started telling me from basically the day that we met about this series of stone sculptures that lived inside of a like gentrification buildings hof or courtyard. Um, and she basically said like, I don't know, one day they put in these stones, these giant square stones, and then they have water running through them and they just kind of left them there. And of course it's Germany, the stones, like the water froze, the stones started to crack. And this photo is from 2017. Um, and so it was, I think many years into this process, I think 10 years into this process. Um, and I 
became kind of obsessed with these things. And I became very interested in what it meant to leave something outside and to leave something alone. Um, and alone is kind of like a funny term, right? Because in my head, when I first started thinking about this stuff, I was like, oh, like it's the artist is removing themselves. But of course the artist's ego and self is all still kind of wound up in it. It became much more for me as I started to do this with my own work to kind of um, make something and then kind of let it move into a different type of environment away from the, the white cube space. Um, so this work's title is I do not pursue quietly, I devour. In winter, I flew to Berlin to see you and you told me about these fountains that you used to take the long way to see. The fountains were large stone cubes placed in the courtyards of all these new office blocks that went up around your Eastern Berlin subway station. When the cubes were first placed, they were new and beautiful and each cube was a different type of stone. And slowly the water eroded them, winter came and the water would freeze sections of the stone and pieces would fall off and shatter. Your friend said that she was there when it happened once. The sound was very loud and memorable. It startled her and then realizing the rarity, she felt happy to be startled. A mouth can also be an opening, I think. You told me all of this two years before I actually saw these fountains, right when I was trying to do something similar with leather, inscribe time across an object that's actually also living. This was around the same time that I found that I could not stop thinking about what Auden said in memory to Yeats, for poetry makes nothing happen, it survives. In the valley of its making, where executives would never want to tamper, flow on south, from ranches of isolation and the busy griefs, raw towns that we believe and die in, it survives. A way of happening, a mouth. I kept having dreams that I was a mouth or that I was being eaten, I kept wondering what kind of stone I was and then forgetting what I had decided on. When I saw myself, I couldn't believe it and scarcely remember. Maybe there are things that we should have become accustomed to not seeing. That or what June Jordan said in It's Hard to Keep a Clean Shirt Clean. What's any one of us to do about what's done? I would never expect to see a piece fall off of one of these stones, especially now that they are covered in moss. I would expect to see an elephant alone in the zoo. You'll be surprised to hear that when you touch a tree that was burned one year ago after it has rained one day ago, that the tree feels like damp cardboard and that your hands will be covered in soot. By creating a, a perimeter around something, I'd argue that you have a form of opening. And so this was kind of my like first wanderings around these questions. And I, I actually, reading it now, reading it again now, I'm like, I kind of disagree with that. <laughs> But I, I don't know if I, I don't know, like, if my disagreement is all that relevant, because what then it kind of led me to was um, the ideas for this exhibition that I had um, two years later in Dusseldorf uh, at the Julia Stoschek collection called Circumscribe. And the ideas around Circumscribe were very much about, like, drawing perimeters around something, but not fully touching it to try and understand it. And... It, well, whatever, we'll get to me undoing myself later. But this work <laughs> from that exhibition is called Leah and I were walking through the park once and I was telling her all about the cows and what they might mean sitting out there waiting for me to come back to them. We sat down on a bench overlooking where the lake ends by the boathouse. It was just before when the street lights go on. The light was blue and sinking. We looked at the water, pausing, thinking between ourselves. The water was still and an exact mirror of the sky. As we were thinking a great deal, all these ducks descended from the sky. I would say a hundred of them, at least. The sky and the water blackened with them. They all landed on the water at nearly the exact same time, as though they were some sort of reflection of themselves descending into themselves, or the all is one, or this is such or such a thing. They've attached a particular word to an object or a fact, and thereby consider themselves to have appropriated it. The women say they've reduced you to silence. The women say the language you speak poisons your tongue, lips. They say the language you speak is made of words that are killing you. Whatever they have not laid their hands on does not appear in the language you speak. This is apparent in the space they have not been able to fill with their words. These spaces can be found in the gaps, in the perfect circle, to imprison them and to overthrow. 
And so this title kind of is split between my memory with my friend Leah, and then this like direct quote and pull from Monique Wittig's Le Guerriere. And I had spent a long time thinking about Le Guerriere and this basically to sum up as quick as possible <laughs> the um, what Le Guerriere was about. It's a not, it's like a non-subjective book. So it's written from the point of view of many women in the, in a war of the sexes. And so the women are describing this war that they won against the male race um, and sort of there's a lot of new interpretations actually about how it was written in French and then translated into English. Um, it actually seems as though the, that Monique Wittig was saying those who are just not men. So not suggesting that everyone was necessarily like quite female or assigned female at birth, but rather that it was just not man. Um, and so this group of not men were sort of trying to figure out exactly how to reconstruct society outside of this patriarchal reality, knowing that the only reality that they understood or could theoretically replicate was patriarchal. And they're kind of asking this question over and over again, of like, how do we do this if we don't know anything more? Um, which is an interesting question, of course, because it's like, there is so much more to know. <laughs> and there are so many other things to know that it's kind of funny that that question was such a preoccupation. Um, but it was something that I was also quite preoccupied with for a while there. And I was just like, how, how do I get out of this thing? And it's like, of course, I, I grew up in like on Miwok land. So just outside of San Francisco. And my entire childhood was filled actually with lots of other options. And I wasn't thinking about them in this process, which is kind of funny to say now. Um, moving right along. Um, in this show, at Stashek, so 2019, um, I had made this film to try and explain why I was so obsessed with cows and why it was that I thought cattle were tied to questions that I had about freedom. And so I became kind of obsessed with um, this song that my daughter used to go to sleep, which um, is by Nina Simone. And the song is called, um, Wow, I can't even remember the title of the song, but the words of the song are, I wish I knew what it means to be free. And she asked this question, like, I, I want to know what it means to feel free, but if I knew that, I wouldn't be myself. And kind of wondering, like, okay, well, if, if, free, if my very bondage is my very being, how could I desire, and I love myself, right? How could I desire to be free from this bondage? Like, what, it, what does that mean? Like, do I desire to be something else entirely? Do I desire to not exist? Do I desire to destroy myself? And of course, like, you know, after making the work, I was like, yeah, I do, I think. <laughs> and that's also kind of a funny thing to kind of realize about yourself to be like, no, no, no more. Um, but so like, this is, my, this is my kid sort of like kind of crying and then slowly going to sleep to the song. And that's kind of how the film sort of begins. Um, I was also very, my parents' house burned down also in this time period, and I was also very preoccupied by the fact that the place that I was from was not the place that it could have been or was when I was growing up, that like if we had paid attention to different forms of knowledge, none of this would have happened, and sort of being frustrated and infuriated by that, but also then being kind of just like, okay, so here we are, and so this is like this is the view of, um, of Marin County from uh, a dad's drone uh, that I stole and put into the film. Um, so yeah, so this film is called, among other things, Nearby Occasions or Eight Acts for Jeremy. What should we call this form of existence? A constant vista where from one view, one can see the cage of one's binding and from another view, another binding state Come here and have a taste, play to be played. Hottie writes, all night I dreamed of these lines and I couldn't help it other than believing that dreaming these lines meant I should send them to you. It's coming from an old poem that made sense to me when I saw the cage bird, cage inside the bird. Birds are free of cages and cages are free of birds. Where have you come from that causes you to be so free? Although every bird voice is a kind of crying for the end of the day, 
You must sing more since your cry more sounds like the beginning of the day. I think birds are standing for people, but I'm not sure what the cage stands for. You must know. I don't. Maybe there are things that we should have become accustomed to not seeing or knowing. I entered the tunnel of my own will. I play the song over and over, without beginning and without end. Or when you drug up the past needlessly, the Dutch say you're digging up old cows. Yeah, my friend Hottie wrote to me after I had performed inside of Bruce Nauman's Double Cage. And I kind of took that writing and molded it into this title. Um, I still don't, I don't know, I still, I watched this film and I still don't fully understand it. But I was trying to ask this question of what it meant to subjugate animals and think that we were also being subjugated ourselves. Um, and I had a lot of questions too about all the different ways that capitalism had wormed its way into my life and my expectations of being a person. Um, so yeah, so this film was kind of the, I wouldn't say, it was kind of the key to the whole exhibition. Um, and then meanwhile, I kind of was then playing out all these odd different scenarios throughout the exhibition. So I was putting these live stream cameras on rocks. And of course the live streams were, they didn't go anywhere and I didn't record them. So they were like quasi performative and also surveillance based, but there was no, I wouldn't say there was like a, a point to the surveillance. Like the, the rocks were being watched to be watched and the rocks themselves were also this kind of like a hard to pin down object. I had run into this person um, who had this stone, Zimbabwean serpentine stone, and he was very protective of it. Um, and actually, it actually might be faster if I just redo the title. Maybe that's going to be easier. So these works, these like four works, are split into four different titles. Um, and I'll read three of them now. So the one that's closest to us, this with this split rock inside the tank, it's called Strange Provenance Landscape Number One. Before we begin, let me establish some things that I cannot name through Serpentine and the Rhine. I've split three stones and polished one. You'll see them here. All of these stones come from Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is a landlocked country in Southern Africa known for its dramatic landscape and diverse wildlife. It's about the size of Germany. My German friend Stefan went to Zimbabwe in 1998 to learn about sculpture from the legendary Shona sculptors of Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe has many colors of stone. There are ancient dried riverbeds in Zimbabwe and each riverbed is filled with different types of stone. The black kind in particular is known for its delicacy under stress. Few black stones can boast such endurance. Stefan and his friends went to all of the different mines and mined some of the stones and Stefan put them in a shipping container and sent them home to Hanover where 17,000 tons still remain on the family farm. The stone is serpentine from Zimbabwe. It's shown here in filtered water from the Rhine. That is Rhine from Middle High German, Rin, as in just down the road and ultimately from Galish Renos, meaning that which flows, to move, to flow, to run. And then strange provenance number two, which is this work in the back here. Serpentine rewires your brain. A hot flame makes its way up. Serpentine is about rebirth and beginning and returning as a snake enjoys the snack of its own tail. Definitely a convenient way to use vibrational energies. So does the stone remind us of our position as bodies in an orbitable transit. Snakes actually do eat their own tails. It's a sign of distress. But the snake is a stand-in for something else now. This action of a snake body is referred to as the Ouroboros, and of the Ouroboros it is said. One is the serpent, which has its poison according to two compositions. One is all and through it all, all and by it all, and if you have not all, all is nothing. And then, this is the stream. And then the fourth one, which I for some reason don't have an image of, um, is to be clear, when I put this rock here, we were nearly the same color. I can't speak for it or me now. What I mean is that I have gone through great lengths to change my color to no real avail as the pigment is fixed. It rather moves around depending on where it is, most needed. This is not dirt, he says. This is the crust of Zimbabwe. It stays on the stones because that is where the stones stayed. I suppose I split them to see what was inside. 
So while the beaten and mutilated body presumably establishes the brute materiality of existence, the materiality of suffering regularly eludes recognition by virtue of the bodies being replaced by other signs of value, as well as other bodies. Let us pretend that the rock is an empty vessel. Is it violent to leave room for my imagination within something else? Can one's own eye be given? So those are the questions that I was kind of messing around with in 2019. And to hear them now is kind of funny because I feel like a lot of my answers to them are like, what, what was I thinking about here? What was I trying to sort through? And a lot of it was kind of questions about who belongs where and when and who gets to say what belongs and how come. And so I was looking at these rocks that like had been in Germany long enough to be German citizens, but would never be, <laughs> you know? And then I also was thinking about what it meant to take something away and kind of hoard it and hold on to it or something for what purpose, you know? Stefan was never gonna, he was, he was never gonna use them for anything unless the right person came along to convince him that they needed to be used. He would rather like save them and protect them in Hanover than let them just become some random sculpture, which I thought was also quite interesting. And what I ended up doing was just kind of putting them inside this rhyme water and over the course of the exhibition, which I think was like six months, they started growing stuff all over them, of course, right? Because the water is filled with things. And when there's oxygen in water, it grows stuff. And so in some ways I was like kind of repeating in a very closed box, this thing that was happening with the stones that I saw in 2017 and kind of wonder like, oh, okay, I'm putting something together only to when the exhibition comes down, take it apart again, put the stones somewhere else and kind of step away again and kind of I'm here, I'm not here. What is that? Um, yeah, 2019. <laughs> um, and then we'll jump again two years to this grouping of paintings that are all um, very quickly aged leather paintings um, that I made after I returned to my parents' land uh, where the house had burned down, sort of sat down and was like, okay, like what's, what's here? <laughs> like, what is the deal here? Um, and I started to make these cow paintings, kind of leaving them outside, but not for very long. Um, and these three works come together in one long poem. And the poem is called, There's a Black Fly in Your Chardonnay. Outside, I've never been lonesome. Always a fence, a plank, an eyebrow in the ocean, a baby received in a house. Anything tall is a tree. The sky rearranges itself in the desert. The sky rearranges itself in the water. The sky rearranges itself while I am in the sky. How lucky I thought I was to see the street lights turn on. Clouds like rows of planting. Mistakes we make and agree to continue. A view of the river, my rock in the glade, bigger, regatil relatively, and still until I pull my zipper open like a lover. I said it backwards, but it sounds better that way, actually. I drag a trowel through them. I lick the paint off my own stick. I have a cold back and wet ankles. Later, a slow moon laboring over the hillside. Later, the fog reflects the moon. Later, my blood is sucked and I itch. Will we, will we ever find home? The car calls us in the distance. To walk the stairs, to take off my shoes, to stand wringing hands, scratching grass blades on toenails. You're starting to see things we could never see before, like you've been born, or how I waited a whole year for September. A piece of fruit, a source of fire, an edge, an excuse on a small scrap of paper. The wood's in my mouth. It's so hot today, like yesterday and the day before. Okay, so those are some some cows and, a, and like a piece of writing that I was trying to think through. Um, and now this is like some of my most recent work. Um, this is a footage from a live stream. Um, I'll just let the footage play while I kind of describe this work. Um, so in, during the pandemic, I started talking a lot to this really uh, rad curator named Aram Moshetti, who's at the Hammer Museum. And Aram was putting together a um, a show based on the Gesamtkunstwerke. And so he wanted to make a show that was kind of based around a series of texts. And then from those texts, the show would kind of emerge and play itself out. And so I wrote a text um, kind of loosely based on my time um, as a kid on, um, on Pimu, which is uh, 
known as Catalina Island, which is like, I think, I don't know, 50 or 60 miles off the coast of Los Angeles. It was kind of the one place in the kind of LA area that I had like a really deep connection to. Um, it's a very odd and funny island. Um, it's owned by the Wrigley family. And there's also like a herd of buffalo on the island. And I found that totally absurd. Um, I had gone to graduate school with this really amazing Lakota artist named Kite. And I knew that Kite was interested in, in buffalo, but also interested in kind of these absurd, like meanderings of things coming together. And also Kite was one of the few artists that I knew that was from LA who had a lot of like really cool, like like-minded things going on. So immediately I was like, Kite and I have to work together. And so when I reached out to her, she was like, well, dude, that's Tongan land. We gotta find a Tongan artist. Like who, who do we know that's like, that might be interested in trying to talk to us that would talk to us a little bit more about Pibu. And um, that's how we found um, this amazing person called Al Frank. Um, and Al Frank then proceeded to be like, oh yeah, like there's a lot to know. <laughs> and told us a lot of really interesting stories and shared with us a lot of amazing knowledge. Um, and then we started to get to work and we sort of asked like, okay, well, so, so what could we do here? And, you know, each of us was interested in doing it and talking about different things. And we were kind of like, okay, well, we'll just like keep going and put things together. One of the things that El Friend gave us as a gift was um, she sung us a song. And that song um, was a song that was sung by young Tongan children when they were being taken to the missions and when they were in the missions. And the song basically describes their desire to, to leave, to be taken away from this awful place. And um, what was fascinating about it, like not the song itself, but Kite decided, okay, I wanna take the bell tower on Catalina, which rings every 15 minutes. And I want to translate this song that El Frank has given us for the bells. And so of course we thought, okay, this is great. This is, this is a really interesting thing to do. Um, because the island is still privately owned, there's a lot of, uh, I wouldn't say secretly seen necessarily, but there's a lot of odd ways of thinking about how they relate to people that are Tongan. And that was something that we were hoping that because of the museum's access and financing abilities, we could kind of bypass. And we sort of, we began this process of asking if we could use the, use the chimes very like openly they had been for years trying to fix the bell chimes because they didn't have enough money to fix them. The museum said, you know what, whatever it costs, we'll pay. We just want to have the, like, we just want our artists to have the opportunity to use the chimes for this piece. And we started saying, oh, well, we, we could do it for just the run of the show, which is three months, or like at some point as they started to be like less and less interested, we are like, we just want to use it once. Like we'll pay all the money to fix your chimes and we just want to use it once. And we went through lots of different channels and at some point they were just like, absolutely not. And we couldn't exactly figure out why. And of course we know why, right? It's like for them to acknowledge this essentially like slave song sung by young children as like part of the history of the island that makes things more complicated. It takes away from this, this thing that they're trying to export. And so that was like, that was like what um, what Kite called a gift that they chose not to receive. And this kind of process of us trying to find different ways of participating on PIMU and then also in, in LA, um, it was kind of endless. And so it reached a point where by the time it was time for the exhibition, we couldn't really do any of the things that we had hoped to do. So our original goal was to have a live stream of a large piece of rock that, um, a large piece of um, soapstone that Elle Frank had asked be brought from Pimu to LA so that she could work and teach people how to do traditional stone carving work. That never happened, despite the fact that the, that the, um, that the mining company that's on the island that takes all the stone out of the island was super happy to give us stone for free. For some reason, we couldn't find anywhere that would take it and that would hold on to it for El Frank and would have a place where El Frank could come and gather with her community. And so it became this kind of like this head fuck of a thing where it was like, we could get only so far, 
But every time that it became any sort of conversation about, you know, what what we actually wanted, which was the gathering of Tongan people, or to kind of, you know, describe some little part of the history of this place, it, it suddenly fell apart. And that was, I don't know, that was obviously disheartening, but it was an odd experience as like a Black American person to realize that like, it, not to realize, but to see with my own, in my own process, the kind of obvious desire of the United States to continue to not give a fucking shit <laughs> about the Native Americans. Um, it was, yeah, it was really, really frustrating. Um, it was frustrating for the museum as well. And of course, Pite and uh, L. Frank were both just like, I mean, man, this is how it goes. And of course, this is how it goes, right? That's, that's how it goes. So this piece is what I ended up projecting in the museum. Um, and it basically was the thing that I could take from them that they couldn't tell me I couldn't have. So on the Catalina website, there is a live stream of Two Harbors, which is where I spent most of my child, like a, lot, a large part of my childhood in the summers. Um, and it you basically looks directly at Los Angeles. And so I called this piece, How Like the Weather, The Heresy of Definition, What to Even Call a Day, Determiner, Like How a Mallet on Stone is the Same as a Hand on a Fleshy Bit, Hitting a Body, a Large Quantity Always Becomes an Issue, The Immeasurable Can Never Really Lie Fully Open, A Definitive Expenditure of Mass, Volume, Accumulated into Not Any, Mostly Tacking into the Wind, The Ocean in the Evening, The Kelp Across My Body, cool rippled skin, bladders full orange fish guarding red things and I small and big enough to be away and in the ocean, weary, codified, restless laughter, unquenchable and determiner, slut for time contained within its spatial occupation, like a fuss, I'll be no minute and where is your stuff? You won't be able to see all of this, even the bacteria has seasons, no rocks in the garden or this is all I can take, gathering enough, determiner, interfere, can you see the water in the glass? Say no to this reasonable request, denied and in writing, ever moving sun determiner. I want to sleep when it's dark. Yeah, so that's what I had. <laughs> and then Kite has been working a lot with um, these amazing things called ideographs. And so what she ended up doing was making a large scale, um, a large scale ideograph for the museum wall which describes us as artists trying to work with El Frank to get these series of gifts given to El Frank so that El Frank can do her work and then being denied left and right. Um, yeah, I think that is it. That's kind of a quick rundown of some stuff I've been working on. Um, the end. <laughs> wow, that was amazing. You know, tons to tons to talk about um like super like super happy to have just walk through um those years in which you've been trying to think through a set of problems really great and there's going to be tons to talk about i'm going to um make sure that I don't go over because I really want to chat. Um, so what I thought I would do, and I think it's gonna rhyme really well, is um, use some examples from um, Cotter being uh, mainly films. We also do installations with our films, but Cotter being films, and then a couple pieces that I have to take responsibility for, but within a Cotterbeing methodology. So I, I want to really walk through the stakes of a Cotterbeing methodology on how um, at least we, including, you know, me as a member of Cotterbeing and then me as um, um, a writer and a thinker. And, and again, in Cotterbeing, I'm not the only one that does different things. Like we come together, we come apart, we separate. Um, uh, and the Cotterbeing methodology I want to talk about it that I do think is going to be super interesting after Rindin, your talk um, is the, the methodology in some ways is really 
simple. Um, Cauterbing itself is an Emmy angle term um, that refers to when the tie, the, the, um, the, in, all the members except me are indigenous and their lands are on the coast that stretches across this enormous bay in the top end of the Northern Territory, um, what's called now the Northern Territory. Um, and it, 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 the, the languages of the area are, are Moriamu, Menda, Emiangle, Bachamal, and Keok. Um, and so, uh, and members are from all these groups and from about seven uh, different, uh, we, we now all have agreed to say totemic clans. They tell me to say that. Um, so totemic clans or dreamings that I'll talk about in a second. Um, but Karabing, so Karabing is a word. It's a word in Emmy, and it mean it refers to when the tides are at their lowest, and they go, they really stretch right out. Um, and so you can see the reefs and the the water channels. You can use the mangroves. You can get uh, oysters. So there's a lot of things you can do when the tides are really out. You can walk across creeks that separate country when the tides are up, and when they're up and set to return to the um, to, to the ocean, um, it's called Katakal. So Katabing is one of two tides, Katakal and Katabing. Um, and in 2000, and oh, we don't really know, 2009, um, when we were trying to think about what to call the collective, um, a number of folks, and I, I think it was Cecilia Lewis uh, who, who really finally uh, suggested Karabing as a way of describing the, the group and it really caught on. The reason we did so is that it's a, it's a word, like, you know, and it refers to the environment, but it's also a concept. It's a concept that insists as opposed to the way in which the settler state tries to divide indigenous people into little territories. I was really struck by the, the to, to circumscribe that that part of the your work Rindin, when you're thinking about well I'll put a little box around it. And Karabing is really working against that way of thinking about one's relation to country, to land, to each other, to the ancestors, both human and more than human, by saying, yeah, of course, you know, everybody knows where their their lands are and what their totems are and they're you know they're we know where they are um, but they got there by these uh, routes or routes I should say routes um, based on a, different things that happened and they then they sat down in various places and shaped the geographies and so to as Linda Yerwin says uh, who's a senior Emmy angle member of the group as she says, you know, we have our own land because of the connections and geographies that were established by these routes taken. And so Katabing methodology really thinks about the specificity of place um, for people, but always foundationally within an understanding that those, those individual places are the shape, the, the, the material they are because of the way they're entangled or connected to other places. And that, and it's not just a place, it's like bodies and smells and environments and geographies. And, you know, so there's multiple marriages, like, you know, French, all of these ways in which if you want a place to stay in the shape it is, then all these other modes of relationality have to be kept in place. So it's in a in a nutshell, it's like, yeah, everyone has their own country because of the way they're interconnected, right? And again, it works against this capitalist methodology and the settler uh, me methodology in a settler's most quote progressive form, which is, you know, we recognize that y'all have country, but then in order for the state to give you the rights to your own country, they cut it into these little chunks, they circumscribe it, right? Um, and so, 
so that's what it called a big methodology. And one of the things that uh, we started noticing very early on, you know, and I've, we've all been thinking about a lot and I've definitely been thinking a lot, are the stakes of this kind of methodology in the production of, I don't know, we like art, film, fiction, doco fiction, carving fiction, um, whatever we want to call it, that like, how do we, how do we let this carving methodology really press in to the kind of, I don't know, common sense curating we do with various forms of fiction. So um, probably I'd have to say the, the first moment in which this whacked into my head was during the making of our first film, When the Dogs Talked. Um, and the when the dogs talked, um, is a, it's a it's 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 a short film that tells the story of um, a group of of Cotterbing looking for one of its members um, because she's walked out of an overcrowded house in Darwin and they don't know where she's gone. But the housing authorities have come and said, you know, if she doesn't come into the office and explain why everything's overcrowded. Um, she's going to lose the lease. So they end up way out in the bush. Um, and they um, come upon uh, some other relatives of them, uh, of Cotterbing, who are doing a GPS project um, that map the travels of these ancestral dogs. Now, the, when the dogs talked is, I don't know, doco fiction. We say Cotterbing, it's Cotterbing story. And again, as Linda Yerwin puts it, they're they're real with a little bit of story added on top, meaning that all our films come out of common experience and common knowledge and and the way in which all of us have been um, taught how to properly belong to each other and the landscape. And then a little story on it is is you know we shape it into. Um, something more like a, a story. Um, and so I'm going to show one little clip um, uh, in which the, this group that decide they're going to, instead of going back to Darwin to save their house, they're going to keep on going with um, everyone to map these ancestral dog tracks. Um, and it's, uh, so I'm just going to share my screen for a sec. Where now? They're here now. They're not right. Who would you drink? What would that dream mean? Dream in him like robbing a country. Did it happen after the dinosaur or before? What? Him like a like a dinosaur time, and it that bujut. Huh? Well, the old people that walk around there. Herman, what do you think been make this all here? Yeah? Imagine what you think. From being all got that little poem and love that Robin got a stick. No, he looked like a man's in the room there, like that, and then he just turned into. Yeah, uh, must be from man, bro. Uh. Yeah, and then he just turned into a dingo. Mm, must be made. From man first, then we turn dingo at big one now. No, no. Must be from machine being dig this hole. Or like, it, it was probably people loose and they... It was probably loose and people just probably just used it, the rough stuff. I don't think so. I don't think so. You can think that way. But you might should listen to the story, what they've been telling about this hole. But it could only work when the people just rubbed it like that. Thing. Yeah, that dingo been doing. Who in any we call him? Dingo would make him like a rubber bed, make him old. How? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. Something that might be from ghosts. I'm sick of this shit now, long and full for the same, 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 same thing. That's good. And why did you come, Ricky? Well, if he ain't shit, everybody's thing. Instead of being bad, sitting there like a dumb person. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Hey, why you more talk for make me laugh? Now you more be a 
Oh my it's God! It's not funny. It's real. It's real. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Very actually. Okay. So, so that's a little clip, and and the way it was made is that it we had gone to you know we had taken the kids um, to this site um, several times, and the first time we went there, a conversation like that developed. Um, and so we just, you know, we just told all the, our kids, like, just recreate the conversation. But what was super interesting about it was that in the course of the conversation that, you know, cause we just rolled the camera in the course of the conversation, Shuri Jane Bionamu, who is the woman, the young woman saying, you know, you should know the story. She really began to feel the truth of it like really making the argument. So getting, feeling the upset in the moment as she's standing on her mother's um, area, which is fine to do there are these water wells. Um, so, so it's based on something that happened um, as the entire film is, um, but with a little story that is, you know, just, just go with the flow. There's no script, you guys just go. Now, in the course of making the film, we, you know, we were, we were camping out bush near to where this is. Um, and during night, of course, the, as is usual, the younger folks would always be asking the older folks just tell all the stories they know about what happened in this place, both human ancestors and more than human ancestors. And so one by one, we were telling the stories until one by one, everyone went to bed um, until me, except me and Ricky Bionamu. And, and I said, you know, it was a nephew of mine. And I said, Ricky, I'm, I'm sick. I got that flu. I need to go, I need to go sleep. Um, and he said, no, no, come on, Andy, tell me more stories. And I said, seriously, I think we told as many stories as we can tell in one night. Uh, I have a new idea. You ask me, a question and I'll answer it and then we get to go to bed. And he said, okay, okay. Um, is, and he asked me, is Bigfoot real? And I said, oh yeah, yes, Bigfoot's real. And I thought, okay, I'm going to sleep. And he said, no, 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 no. If Bigfoot's real, where did Bigfoot come from? Now I'm gonna show a little one minute clip a little animation I made for him to explain where Bigfoot came from. Started a long time ago. Then there were just two kind of people, Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. The way I heard it, no one knows where the Homo sapiens came from. The Neanderthals were just sitting there, minding their own business. Anyways, it went on and on like this for a while to the whole world was nothing but blood. Somehow, one family escaped and found themselves up against a huge swamp. The old people said they had two choices, die or go into the swamp. Everybody wanted to go into the swamp, but the old people said to go into the swamp will have to walk in the night because they'll have the light of day and if we go into the swamp, we'll have to grow our hair long because they'll have the warmth of the fire. And if we go into the swamp, we'll have to eat our food raw because they'll have the dryness of fire. Some people say they went into the swamp and became Sasquatch. Other people say they became an enormous porcupine and one day would shake off the Homo sapiens. All I know is once we did it to the Neanderthals, we started doing it to each other. Okay, so I really liked myself. I told that story at the fire and I just thought, aren't I the special person? Um, and then Ricky said, huh, where's, where's that story for? And I said, oh, nowhere. He said, oh, you just made it up. I said, yeah. He said, oh, well, that's interesting, auntie. Do you have any real stories? Right. And at that moment, I just thought, yeah, boom, there's, there's, there it is. There's the hammer being set down, right? Because the difference between what we, you know, the, within fiction, of course, there's, 
and it's within fiction in a Western imaginary, Western hegemony that I think, you know, still kind of sits in, in, in its certain uh, museum and gallery spaces is this idea that myth is a kind of fiction, right? There's fiction and there's myth as a kind of fiction. But of course, what Ricky's saying and what Karabin is saying is that the stories of the dogs that left this imprint on the landscape that created modes of belonging and connection is not fiction. It is true, right? Whereas the origins of Bigfoot, totally fiction, fictional, right? And, and the, the value systems that accumulate around these two kinds of quote fictions are really also, of course, totally interesting. Like, wow, like creative people who can make stuff up, right? As metaphor, which can be used to think about things globally or in some ways. So that, you know, in, in Little Origins of Bigfoot, it's like colonization. Like, how do we think about Homo sapiens as white colonizers? Um, but it has no place, right? It, its place in a Western imaginary fiction is any place, right? That universal gesture of certain kinds of making of fiction. Um, so I wanna show you, at, which is, which is an, an totally um, contrary to what we're trying to do in the Cotter Bean Film Collective, which is use film in a way that through the activity of making it, um, telling it, bringing together different, gener the thick generations uh, within Cotter Bean, listening and acting it out to know the story, which is true, it, a true story, um, to know where it is, to know where it goes, to know how different people belong to it in different ways, right? As opposed to kind of fiction that has some kind of broad metaphorical universal um, application. Now, we do want people to watch them and think, oh, I get it, but we also, know that they're not going to get a lot of what the films are doing because underneath the story is the truth and for the west the truth is a myth for cotter Bain, it is the ground on which people um, um, act out their forms of survivance um, so a second um very quick i want to show a second clip that from the last film we made. So when the dogs talked was the first film, it has the aesthetics, more of the aesthetics of a, I don't know, ficto doc, I, I suppose. And the third film we made, we, we kind of threw out our very lovely, very small non cotterbing film crew. And we started shooting uh, our films on iPhones, um, which just kind of freed them up. And we also started thinking about the way in which these uh, uh, different forms of time act in a way, in, in hegemonizing way in relation to this divide between fiction, nonfiction, myth, truth, and et cetera. Um, and in particular, the way in which a lot of the reception, some of the reception was like, oh, so these are the myths from the past and now you guys are in the present and do your ancient myths help us save the planet? A lot, of, a lot of us help us save the planet. Like how does your ancient knowledge perhaps help um, in terms of climate change, toxicity, uh, capitalist destruction and et cetera. Um, and so a lot of the, our films, when we started using the iPhones, but but also as we're listening to the way in which this division of time was working, um, we, we started putting very, all the times in the same visual space. So the, you know, the use of montage and overlay to do it. Um, in order to argue as Angelina Lewis, is very, I mean, a very strong argument and Rex Edmonds and others, all of it, everybody. Uh, that um, time is sedimentation, time is materiality, 
time, there isn't a past. There's, there's the accumulations of an ongoing ancestral present. And um, so I thought I would show a little clip from The Family and the Zombies uh, that gets, tries to intervene in this hegemony of time and tries to show the ways in which bodies themselves are not opaque to the lands in which they walk through. Dying. Nobody did listen to me. Better good been come, Lawi. Better good been come, make him wrong, Lawi. Make him wrong, better good been come, make him wrong. Blame him, let me Seven always go, Lawi. Yeah, Lawi. Sing it, Lawi. Where we come up? Where we come up? Some to grow up will kill. We are all the whole place and all story and we all can. Do you get map? I got the whole story. Robin against the cell. He used to have a human being in before. And after that, he have to eat it, that chicken and bring it raw, and he twisted his tongue and start talking all kind of different lingo then. Uh, this story is all about this one, not about this lingo. Why is he cooking? You've got to talk again, Adia. Yeah, chicken. Yeah, but the chicken. Where we come from? 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 So this is a, what happens in the at this point in the film is that everyone they go through all these places and then talk about the way in which they're interconnected. But we attempt to use this layering in order to um, not only put the the ancestors in the ancestral present, both the human and the more than human world but also put in the same framework what is also true, which is there's capitalists in there, there's miners in there, there's the police state in there, there's pollution in there, there's climate uh, change in there. There are all of these modes of life crowded into the same space. And if for Cotterbing, if we seek to hold on to the shape of the land in order to hold on to the shape of people and the more than human world, then we have to really work to not give way to a form of fictional thought that divides fiction into say the creative arts that we, you know, some of the talented people can pull out of their heads and then mythological thought, which for the West is a form of fiction, but rather hold on to the truth of these stories and hold on to them in the present. So I, I don't wanna go any further. I had other things to say, but I wanna, uh, Rindon, I wanna have time to, for us to talk together. Cool. Thanks for sharing that. You're welcome. I was going to also, you know, you was so much about rocks. The last part of what I was going to talk about are this 
these two projects that we're doing within this Cotterbeing methodology, one, these rock pre, pre invasion rock fish traps that are around this point um, that are right next to really important um, totems that some of which are reefs and some which are sand and some of which are water holes. So there's this project we're doing on that. And then parallel to that, there's this, I don't know, graphic novel writing thing called Alice Henry and the Collapse of the Western Plateau, which is also about the crazy fucking shit of settlers not letting go to a certain kind of fiction that they're everywhere and thus nowhere, right? Um, so it's all about rocks and all about like, like sedimentation and formation, but tra-la, because <laughs> your stuff is so interesting all about you know it's just like so much about rocks and mines right yeah and quarries and taking stuff out of i don't know because it's like i i guess what i started to think about especially after the like zimbabwean rock work was kind of finished yeah. i was just like yeah. like as i was starting to realize like okay if i let go of my own understanding of time like then what exactly have have we done by moving all these rocks around and so and yeah. of course then like you know showing up in catalina uh, on pimu and just looking at looking at this like hillside that's just like completely destroyed and mm -hmm. sort of this like mm -hmm. kind of looking at these giant machines and the dudes who run the mine they never mm -hmm. let anybody in first of all so it was mm -hmm. weird to just be there and chill there but then to see how they were breaking up each of the rocks like they put in these giant, um, essentially drills and make these huge holes and then wait for the rocks to split. And then of course it's yeah, like, yeah. you see inside the splitting, there's like so many different types of rocks. And they're like, oh yeah, such a bummer because this rock is an amalgamation of all these other different types of rock, we can't use it. And I'm like, then, but you took it away from the spot. I, I don't know, it's just like. No, no, that's totally, I mean, it's really. <laughs> like, and there's it's it's so my one of the reasons I think that this the Cotterbing methodology that I'm trying to like we're all trying to like sort out and it's really like I try and like Alice Henry and the collapse of the Western Plateau it's really it's, it's really fun it's it's going to be fun but I just sit here and I think I hear Ricky saying where is it and it's like <laughs> And then I think, well, it is everywhere because settler colonialism was such an invasive fucking weed. And, but the, how to use art to, for us to keep what is outside of, in the Western imaginary, outside of bios, yeah. right? That has no indwelling potential. Like humans, you know, capitalist miners can go in and, expose its potential, but you know, it's inert. And and like, how do we disrupt that? And, and Katabin's really, I mean, everybody's like, Natasha Bigfoot, we were talking the other day and we we're talking about mining and she said, you know, white people, if they're not there, they think it's, there's nothing there. But like, look at our country, you go there, there's, there's beaches and there's rock and there's the rock fish traps that someone made and the reef and the pigs and the cow and the kangaroo and they were all there first and right and if we don't help them stay in place where are we going to go but it's it's so simple i don't know what you think but for me it's like so simple it's like you know and plus we have a big mine just down south of bellune that just started opening because of course it's they're they're mining for lithium for the you know for the green economy and the place is leaking toxins like there's no one's business for the green economy yeah. for the right for sorry green energy for green energy i for mean green energy yeah it kind of it's it seems like at every turn with thoughts about green energy it seems like the only real answer is to stop desiring the things that we've been taught to desire and it's kind of just, it's like laughable when they're like, oh, okay, like we'll make a mine to get this lithium out and cause all this toxic bullshit. Or, oh, we could get it from the bottom of the ocean and uh, mess around yeah. down there. Like that yeah. could be a possibility. It's like, or we could just not anymore. 
or, or we, we could, could just like, yeah yeah exactly or we could just stop already you know when you were saying you said um at part and i was taking notes <laughs> um what does it mean to be free from this history right and if uh, you put it in a way uh, honestly i i I was really happy because I wrote something that almost exactly like that because I was thinking, well, what it, on the one hand, what does it mean to um, to keep going like, but differently? So in like Alice Henry, it's like the Western mining extraction machine. They just won't stop. So it's just this collapsing, their underground collapsing, collapsing. But also like Cotterby, just, you know, it's, we're stubborn never going to stop trying to keep their country in place. Um, what would be to have been freed from that? Well, we wouldn't be who we were. So I was really, I, you know, and I was, I was thinking that because like, we, sorry, I clicked when you said, we just need to stop. We need to stop using so much energy. We just, that's the only solution. Stop it. And I, but it also was like, and then we would be different. And I was so intrigued when you said, well, do I want to be different, especially if I love myself? I think, yeah, exactly. And then you said, yes. And I thought, amazing. Because isn't it a paradox? Like, yeah, it is. Like, I do love myself. I'm, but, you know, for me, I come from this crazy sh shit, these Alpine, like our village up in the Alps, they were insane and very tough people, very brutal. But, you know, when you get to America white, but would you, I like me, but would I do what they did to me to anyone else? No. Yeah, so I, I was hoping you'd say a little more about that. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's been on my mind. I don't, it's like, cause I'm also trans too. So there's also this like yeah. funny other thing yeah. that's happening kind of in the background too, yeah. of kind of like, I, there's always this kind of undertone of like, okay, well, like, so you're a dude. I mean, on paper, yeah. And to like yeah. stuff from the government, yeah. But like when I open my mouth, it's very obvious, like not your average dude. And kind of this, like, there are definitely moments where I'm like, God, it would be so much easier if I could just right. blend. But then again, then I wouldn't know everything that I know and knowing these things makes life so much easier. <laughs> it's like- Well, I mean, a more interesting so when, if, yeah. you know, if you can survive it, right? Yeah. And it also yeah. just, I don't know. I don't, it's, it's important to know or something. And so it's like, I yeah. want all the knowing, but at the yeah. same time, like my partner, my partner is Australian and she's like a classic Australian mix of person where like, her mom is, uh, her mom's like, quote, Jewish, but from no origin. And then her dad <laughs> is from somewhere in what used to be Burma. But again, he also like kind of doesn't want to engage with that part of himself. Yeah, 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 and yeah, yeah. at some point she was talking to me and she was like, she was like, yeah, I've been thinking about what time in history I would want to be recreated in, mm. like what type, mm. what part in time. And I kind of like in my own sort of like my own sort of selfish trans spiral thing, I was like, well, I can't live anywhere, but now like, and just mm. that was in my head. And then mm. she was like, I'd like to live somewhere where nothing changes for 10,000 years on either side. And she's like, whatever reality that is. And I just was like, I think that doesn't exist. But if it does, yeah, yeah. yeah it's like, but if it did, what would that even be? Like, what is that out of time yeah. space? Like, what yeah. is that desire yeah, yeah, totally. thing? I don't know. Totally. And that's like her desiring a different selfhood, a different person, a different way. Yeah, yeah, yeah super fascinating. Cause you know, one of the things like the whole, the whole, like what does the Cotterbeek methodology do to kind of our, a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people's kind of, um, uh, you know, common sense understanding of fiction and the values of creativity and then the mythological people whose function is just to repeat and you know that drill and so you know one of the things we've been talking about a lot is trying to get people to understand 
how creative you have to be to keep something in place. Oh my God. And in the context of unrelenting invasions, right? Like you want to know about creativity, try and just keep it the same, right? And so I, I don't know what the knows, and I don't want to get in a fight with you and your partner. <laughs> there is, but, that's the thing, there is no, there is, like, there is no, there is no, like, there is, no. there's, yeah. there's no, there is no elsewhere or outside, like, it's all here, <laughs> in a way. It's all here, it's like, all here, you know, yeah, it's all here, it's, we, you know, we now say kind of the ancestral present, trying yeah. to get people to, like, but like, you know, one of the things that like I'm calling various people's names just so everybody has more name than Elizabeth A. Povenel here. But like one of my brothers, Trevor Bionna, we were, you know, we we had taken a boat across. It was before we had bushwhacked this road. And, you know, we we're going to try and find a water hole. It's a long story. But anyways, we we're found falling birds. And um, as we were walking down the beach, Trevor said, sister look evidence evidence and what he was referring to were these um old uh like uh seashells like snail sea snails and oysters and various kinds of clams that we know how to, what to eat and whatever and and then he said and he pulled up some of the sand he said and look at the look at how much evidence well in his hand were some shells that like it look kind of look like it could have been eaten like 10 days ago and then there were some that looked like maybe 50 days ago and some 50 years and then some that were sand right because it was sand and and again it's all evidence because that sand is exactly what you're saying it won't say the thing that shells gonna become sand it doesn't it's sedimentation, it's sedimentation, yeah. right? Um, so, yeah, so I think it screws with our understanding of you know, like what's creative and what's not creative and the myth as just the, you know, repetition machine and, but yeah. fiction as, fic some of fiction and mine too, I don't know, Randy, mine too, like, like Ricky so called me. It was like, oh, isn't that cute, Auntie? Now, could we go back to the real stuff? <laughs> yeah, no, totally. Yeah, totally. Like, how do you, when you went to Tonga and you were like, the here-ness of it, right? Yeah. Those rocks that are here, and then y'all wanted to pick it up and make it somewhere else. I was going, hmm, I wonder. <laughs> Right? It's a paradox. It's like we can't yeah. we can't move it and still be, I don't know, it's so confusing. It, yeah, it's totally. But and they're being moved all over the place. Yeah. Yeah, they're moved anyway. And if you like look at the entire California, basically all the seawalls in California, all that rock is actually from Pino. And so it's like it's a total head fuck. Every seawall yeah. that you see in yeah. California yeah. Is there. Yeah. It's like, yeah. what? <laughs> and yeah. it's like seawall for what purpose? Yeah. <laughs> like you know, people should read this, the great book, Consuming Ocean um, Island. And um, it's about the this phosphate mining on this Pacific Island that basically, you know, the islands are like this and now they're like that. And so you could say those people who belong to Ocean Island, wherever their phosphate went, then their sovereignty should have gone with it. Or I think Congo and copper in Brussels, like when Congo became this, this pit of like extract value, leave toxicity behind, then Congolese, and not just Congo, but those who belong to these specific places, that they should have sovereignty over Brussels. Hmm. You know, so, so what if, what if we thought settler colonialism, imperialism, extractive capitalism in this way in which, well, you took the, the ground, but you didn't, but the, the belonging stayed with it. Yeah. Right. 
right? Um, I don't know where to go with that anyways. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. Very much. I keep, hmm. I mean, no, that's, that's a fun game. That's a fun game. <laughs> a fun that's game. the game I've been playing. No, it's like a fun, it's a fun game to think about what it would mean if, because it's like, you know, these, these teenagers, these like white kids in Hawaii who are teenagers are suing yeah. the Hawaiian government because they're just like, what the fuck you've taken away, like my right to like grow up as a person, but also you've taken away these lands that should, that I should have claim on. And it's funny because they're white kids and yeah. they don't really have that claim, but they do have a point, right? Which is that like the government uh, has allowed for all this negligence and thus they can't have what they, what is their due as people that are from this place, right? Right. And it's kind right. of like, cool guys, <laughs> but yeah. also like, also like what is, what's the precedence here? How do we, how do we even talk about this at the same time I kind of hope you win, honestly. What precedence does that set then? That does that mean every child could sue every government? Like, what is that? Like, how does this work? I don't know. It's really, it, I keep coming back to this thing. I was like listening, I'm getting really into like uh, complex mathematics for no reason other than it's like kind of funny or something to hear. It sounds like someone's talking about abstract art, but they're actually just talking about numbers. And I've been really obsessed with this guy, Gordel, um, who kind of like came up with this theory. And then he just became, when he was 27, was really good friends with Einstein. And then he just kind of, after Einstein's death, just fell apart. Like he couldn't come up with any more theories. He thought he was just like, just, he felt destroyed. But at some point in this book that I was reading, this guy was like, you know, all Einstein really said was that matter is concentrated energy. And I just was like, wait, so <laughs> like, <Right>. what? <laughs> and so it's like, right. now I'm looking around, I'm kind of like, okay, all matter is concentrated energy. If I, if I'm Congolese, that means that I now own Belgium. Like it's like suddenly <laughs> actually the very building blocks of Western society state that like there should actually be these claims and it's really I don't know it's fascinating well you know another project that we're kind of doing and like there's too many projects obviously <laughs> time space is not concentrated enough but we called it a two clans project kind of gets to the white dudes who are like suing the Hawaiian state or whoever the hell they're suing um Okay, so, so as a Povinelli, <laughs> like me, white Povinelli person, um, my, all Povinellis emerged from this little village in the Alps called Corizolo, and we emerged in like in the, well, it, we, the nickname emerged in, I forget, 1100 or something. And then it, it became a surname. And then we split into clans because like by that time, the Catholic church said can only marry within a certain degree. And so, so I'm a Simonos. I have a clan. I'm a Simonos Um, But it was a shithole place. There was like poverty in the South and poverty in the Alps. And so like, you know, it was not cool. Um, and so they, you know, in the 1890s, the Simonots all start like, and they, they had their own, like, it's a weird place. There was this peasant autonomy. So each uh, village could write its own rules for the commons that it controlled. So family base, there's a lot of rhyming with Katabing. And, but, you know, it's like, fuck this, it's too, we're all dying. And so they do the route like the European route of colonization and they go sit on Seneca lands in, in Buffalo by the like the turn of the 19th century. Um, and so one, and then we have Cotterby clans, right? That you, you saw a little bit about. And so one of the things that we're trying to, and, and right now you have a lot of people in Europe, like you have the bad white nativists, right? So Trump and Obon and all those bad guys, but you also have on the left, a lot of people going, we need to go back to our own pre, sometimes pre-Christian, but pre-private, pre-capitalist modes of commoning, right? Go back. And so literally go back, go back onto the land, go back, learn how to make the cheese and how to do the cows and everything. Okay. These are good guys, right? And they're like your, your beach dudes, right? And I'm like, eh. 
time out a little bit. Um, so in this two clans, but it's like, okay, what if we thought about history as not time, but sedimentation? Exactly the way that we've been talking about, like Congo is in Brussels and, and of course not Congo, but you know, the different groups and not just Congo, like, like, you know, this started in the 1500s, the Inca, like big hurricane came over and like swapped up all this stuff that wasn't it and pulled it back to Europe through Naples. So what if we think, well, then what we'd be doing is saying there is no going back to Comene because what we're seeing is the concaving. We see the concaving of Karabing and not just Karabing, so like what Tonga, what you were doing and the, the mountaining, if you want, of, of primarily white European diaspora. Right. So if you, we want to be allied with indigenous, then we have to concave some of, you know, we have to, we have to get a scoop and we have to scoop out Brussels. Maybe we have to scoop out some Corisolo because now it's very wealthy, super wealthy ski resort. That's like freaking out because the snow's going to melt. But, you know, so how to do that, how to, how to talk to those beach dudes without making them the same as, you know, because they're the human, they're, they're, their bodies are sedimentations of the same sort as like Europe sediment and, yeah. right. Cause I, you know, if, I, yeah, I don't know if I'm clearish, but I, I'm on the dude side like you are, but there's a difference. Right. Yeah, no, exactly. There's a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. And I, I don't, I think what I also, I struggle with just as a, as a person, especially as an American person that lives in Germany, who is just mm. dining on the German state, like it is so chill here. They really, they roll out the carpet for you. Like, mm. I do feel sometimes like a true observer, like just truly watch it as my kid goes to her free daycare, as we enjoy the healthcare. And it's like, I know that all of this is built on things that I disagree with that is also subjugating me. And at the same time, I'm watching. So it's like, I'm, I don't know. And my participation comes in and out and I'm participant. I do things, you know, I, I talk, but there is also this question of like, what, what actions to take and when, mm. when to watch? Like, I don't mm. know. These are kind of, mm. this, is, this is the stuff that kind of preoccupies me in the night mm. as I like, mm. as I'm mm. looking around. Well, that's what, I mean, it's very clear as you're going along. It's just so inspiring to see this both internal, but also collaborative, thinking and then rethinking and then I don't know what like I love it I, I love when you're like I don't know what to do but I'm gonna sit with it Thanks. right I'm gonna yeah. sit with the a lot of when I listen paradox is a word that that flows from your mouth <laughs> which and a kind of comfortable maybe I'm wrong but I'd love to hear if I'm wrong, I'm kind of not a glibness, but a, but a uncomfortable, maybe the wrong word. I'm wondering what word you would use, but not a, not a running away from, let's put it that way. Is that right? No, definitely. Nobody's running. Don't want yeah. to run. From the paradox. No, no. Yeah, no, no, that's right. Make yeah. a house inside of it. maybe. Yeah. Yeah, and and then go. Uh, well, when I hear you, I think yeah, yeah. And then when I walk in, what does that paradox do to different? And again, different people who walk in. Do some yeah. get to stand up, and some have to crunch over. Maybe crunching over is not a bad thing. Yeah. Right. This is marvelous. I think this is a great place to stop. <laughs> yeah. But, I think so. Right. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. You are an uh, uh, inspiring <laughs> thinker and worker. 
Oh, thank I'm you. <laughs> super blessed to have had this time. Oh, just I'm sitting here listening. Yeah. Wow. Beth, I'm just thank you. So I'm so yeah. Thank you. I'm really yeah, You're that welcome. was awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing what you all have been doing with Kata Bing. And I'm just yeah, I'm yay. Yeah. Thank you so much again, uh, Rindon and Elizabeth, for these beautiful and compelling readings and reflections and conversation. It's just been it's just been such a pleasure to sit back and listen to you both. Uh, before we wrap up, I just want to say a huge thank you again to you both for so generously sharing your work, but also for joining in conversation. It's been such a pleasure. And I will also like to quickly thank Olivia, Sarah, and Linda as well for their collaboration developing this event. And also to my colleague, Catherine, uh, for her support. A word of thank you as well to Nottingham Trent University and the University of Nottingham for supporting our events. I hope to see you all soon. A huge thanks again to Elizabeth and Rindon. Thank you. <laughs>